Uh, he's going to be here until Thursday, right? And um, he's very kindly agreed to give us a, a talk on um, uh, turn time and matter theories. Um, uh, take it away, Amit. Oh, I should say, uh, we will be taking Amit to dinner. Um, those people who are interested, uh, let's gather in um, the lobby of Bloomberg at around six. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you very much for the opportunity to take you to speak here. On Thursday, about uh, nine operators in the image of the Simon theory and causalization. First, let me introduce my uh, really wonderful collaborators, Barak Gabay, who is a PhD student at Harvard, and Elan, who is a professor at the university. They are really excellent, and we will see the results. So, let me start with a short motivation of this book. And at the end, I come for a different motivation. Not working. So, uh, Chen Simon duality is this a well established, non perturbative uh, level rank duality. Now, once we couple, it's just not working. Once we, well, once we couple uh, Chen Simon theory to matter in the fundamental representation to boson or fermions, we expect that uh, duality to extend to a duality between boson, the theory of Chen Simon coupled to boson, Chen Simon matter coupled to fermions. And what do I mean by expect? There is an extended, extensive evidence for that, especially at large n, which will be the limit that I'll focus on today. And this comes from the uh, work of uh, understanding correlation function of local operators, uh, the spectrum of monopole and baryon operator, the thermal free energy, the S matrices, and relating well-established supersymmetric dualities to the non-supersymmetric ones. And here are many, many people, and I'm sure I forgot many more that uh, work on the subject. So I try to put all the citations here in the rest of the talk, I will uh, not be too short. First evidence for a duality between boson and fermions once we couple to Chern Simons come from Chern, studying Chern Simon itself. Suppose uh, this is already from the, the paper of Ed from 1998. Uh, I just used the computer. Suppose you want to uh, find in pure Chern Simons the only observables are with surface. Suppose you want to. Uh, Defined this uh, <laughs> this composite operators at the quantum level. Charles Simon's course is topological. What it taught us is how to define these operators at the quantum level so they remain their topological nature. In doing so, require one to introduce what is called a framing. We call a framing regularization. So at any point along the loop, you have to add a small direction to tell you how to regulate the loop. And this will frame the regulation, regularization, the position value of combination function of the Swissel loop only depends on the field topology. And famously, uh, I'd use this to uh, study topologic, uh, topologic invariant properties of loops in the region. Now, in this talk, I'll focus mainly on the SUN or UN gate theory, but I only consider the large and linear. This is the limit where the range of rank of the gate group is taken to infinity with the tooth coupling, which is the ratio of the rank to the level of Chern Simon, kept fixed. And this limit, it doesn't really matter if you are in SUN or UN. And this tooth coupling runs between minus one and one, depends on the sign of the level. If the level is positive, it runs between zero and one. If it's negative, it runs between zero and minus one. The weak coupling limit is the limit where lambda goes to zero, but the strong coupling limit is then you already take its maximal value, which is one or minus one. So when you look on the expectation value of, for example, in a note, a note with the loop in this planar limit, it takes the following form. So function of the tooth coupling and the level K times the, an exponent of I pi lambda time F where f is called the self-linking number. It's the number of times this 
a small vector here, the framing vector, right around the loop as you go around. For, for example, in this picture, it is equal to one. So you see this phase factor, where if this f equal to one, runs between zero and minus one, and lambda runs between zero and one. And therefore, just from studying chance someone itself, you would naively expect that once you let such a frame Wilson loop to end on a fundamental operator, it will continuously interpolate between, say, boson at lambda equal to zero and fermion at the maximal value of the coupling, which is lambda equal to one. Because when I rotate this uh, operator around, it will carry with it the framing vector and make this F field jump by one, acquiring an additional phase. Then any intermediate value of the of the coupling, of the tooth coupling, you expect some fractional statistic between both of the fermions. So this is natural expectation already from bedrock, and we will prove this. So just to remark level rank duality, it map lambda to uh, <coughs> one plus or minus lambda, depends on the sign of K, which interchange the weak coupling, the limit where lambda goes to zero, with the strong coupling, the limit where lambda goes to one or minus one. So to be more specific, what we will consider is the following theory. We consider this is a chain Simon action, action, raise the level of the K, and we couple it either to bosons or to fermions in the fundamental representation. Coupling to fermions in fundamental representation is, is a conformal field theory in three dimensions. The same thing applied to coupling to bosons. You have to tune at order one over n some uh, <coughs> to a coefficient of coupling. And these two uh, models famously are called by uh, Juan and Sasha, quasi boson or quasi fermion theory. And <coughs> For example, the theory of uh, fermion coupled to Sheryl Simon is not dual to this bosonic theory, but it's dual to a Legendre transform of this theory with respect to the spin zero current, which in the <laughs> scalar case is phi degree phi, where in the fermionic case is psi outside. What this Legendre transform does is split its dimension between two and one. In the quasi boson theory, it has dimension one, in the quasi fermion, it has dimension two. Now, let me explain why most of this will not be uh, relevant to what I'll discuss today. And this is about large end count. Uh, <clears throat> so what we will study today is what I would say are the most fundamental observables, the most fundamental operators in such a model, which are line operators that stretch between the fundamental and the line. To our surprise, they will not study them. So I call them the mesonic line operators in terms of the having a fundamental and anti-fundamental, but the line would be an arbitrary smooth path in between them. Let me do some large encounting. First, the matter here, being in the fundamental and adding only say one flavor or, or order one flavor, only contributed order one over n to the expectation value of closed rules. Leaning over and taking the same topological value as in future science. However, if one go and study the expectation value of this mesonic line operator, as in a continuous line between fundamental and anti fundamental, the matter contributed already to only one. Okay. That we see in the three level, the three level is usually just a free propagator between the two uh, fundamentals. Okay. Similarly, it doesn't work. If we talk about the Legendre transform between uh, the quasi fermion or quasi uh, boson theory, the Legendre transform only enters at order one over n squared to the expectation value of closed Wilson loop, and at order one over n to the expectation value of this mesonic line of data. So, in, in the main part of this talk, I'll focus on the expectation value of the mesonic line operators, and then it, would, it wouldn't matter if we are talking about the quasi boson or quasi fermion. This will only enter at the end when I'll talk about connect, the connected correlation function between such bosonic line operators. So, because I'm not sure if we'll uh, have time to 
go through everything, let me first like summarizing the result. And then I'll go and explain them a bit in more details what are the results and what are the main ideas that led to no So the first, if you study a generic line operator in this uh, conformal gauge theory, generically it will have RG flow on the line. So the first thing we have done is to classify all the fixed points of such flow, all the conformal line operators in this theory. The next thing we did is to uh, classify all the operators that can live on the line and all the boundary operators that start their life as fundamental, anti fundamental fields where the lines can end on. The next thing we've shown that uh, this line operator satisfy what we call an evolution equation. So we think about it as a generalization of the loop equation to Chell Simon theory. In the Simon theory, the equation of motion is first of the f equal to zero instead of df equal to zero that we are used to from young days. Correspondingly, the equation where this line operator satisfied is of first order. It tells you that a smooth, small variation of this line can be written as an integral over product of two mesonic line operators. <coughs> Next, on the bootstrap, what we've shown is that the known spectrum of boundary operator that we have derived and this evolution equation are sufficient to uniquely fix the expectation value of this mesonic line. So this is the input data for the bootstrap, and then systematically you can show that these completely fix it. Lastly, <laughs> we've we have shown that the conformal line operators in the theory coupled to boson and in the theory coupled to fermion have the same spectrum of uh, boundary operators to be more correct related by the duality, this duality. Here lambda B is the tooth coupling in the bosonic theory and lambda F is the tooth coupling in the fermionic theory. So under this duality, the spectrum map one to another. You see, this is a non perturbative duality where lambda bosonic, for example, goes to zero, and the fermionic goes to one or minus one, so it's interchange of strong and the weak coupling uh, units. This is why this duality is hard to prove. So they satisfy the same evolution equation, and they have the same spectrum of boundary operator, and therefore the same expectation value of this mesonic line. Also follow that they have the same one over n correction to the expectation value of closed insert. So to, uh, to establish uh, or to demonstrate this bootstrap in particular, we have computed the two-point function of the displacement operator on the conformal line operator. So here is, for example, the expectation value of a straight mesonic line operator. And this is a straight mesonic line operator with two displacement, displacement operators inserted on it at position XS and XT. Now, OL and OY right here are the boundary operators of minimal dimension. And you can show that the <coughs> general ground that this ratio take the form of the single conformal cross ratio associated with these four points to the power of two times the dimension of this operator. One over XST to the four is because the displacement operator always has dimension two. And here there is some function Generally, the function of the coupling, you wrote it as a function of the dimension of this uh, lower operator. And what we find is that this function is also, first, it's also the same function controlled the two point function of the displacement operator when a circular flows with zero. What we found is that it's given by this <coughs> combination of the dimension. I mean, can you define the displacement operator again? Is it, can you define the displacement operator? Is it just something that moves? Sorry, can you define the displacement operator again? I'll uh, go everything in, in much more details uh, soon, but the operator that couple to a linear deformation of the line around any smooth line, okay? If you have a conformal line operator for any, any shape, then this, line, this operator also, always exists. So is it just like, uh, just moving up at moving in some direction. Uh, yeah, moving in, a, in some transverse direction at some point along the line, okay. was not insertion in a specific operator. <clears throat> and uh, 
the dependence of this uh, minimal dimension of the coupling will depend on which line operator we are looking at and whether we are using the bosonic or the fermionic description to describe it. Okay. But the relation is general and applied to all these conformal line operator values. And this, this formula looks very similar to what you get for the formation of sphere free energy by double trace operator. Interesting. Uh, you, you, you weren't aware of this. No. Looks almost the same, or maybe exactly the same. No. But we, we can discuss. Uh, so, uh, just a plan, let me warn that I will not have time to give any detailed explanation, I'll just go over the result to explain why they are and what the main ideas that led to them. But I will not have time to uh, give any details. You can come and ask me after. And for simplicity, I'll assume that the level in the bosonic theory is bigger than zero, and therefore lambda bosonic runs between zero and one, and the dual one runs between the fermionic one between zero and minus one. So the tooth coupling in the fermionic theory would be negative, and the tooth coupling in the bosonic theory would be positive, and the other option is related to this one by part. So I'll start with the theory of general Simon coupled to bosons, then we go to fermion, and finally, if time permit, I'll talk about the boost coupling. So let me start with the bosonic theory. So if you study just standard Wilson line in a theory coupled to boson, you find that there is a non-zero beta function for the bi-scalar joint on the line. So it's not a conformal line of theory. You study what are the fixed points of this flow, and there are two fixed points. In either one of these fixed points, you have the by this is this operator is the joint. This is a, so come with a fundamental and anti-fundamental contracted with the line, not with the other side. At the fixed point, we find that it condenses in the exponent and the coefficient given by two pi lambda over n times plus or minus one. I call the two operators the operator with alpha equal to one and the operator, other operator with alpha equal to minus one. You will see with some arbitrary smooth path, smooth path. And n is the framing vector, so as we did, it, which is quantum definition. And we will see the operator with alpha equal to one is a stable fixed point. Well, the operator with alpha equal to minus one is unstable. And if you change a bit the coefficient of this phi phi dagger in the exponent, you can generate a flow in the operator with alpha equal to one. Um, there are also other conformal line operators, one which are not unitary, or one which has degrees of freedom of the line on the line, but I will not have time to describe. You can come and ask me. So what is a mesonic line operator associated with one of these conformal line operators, adding on two boundary operators, one in the fundamental and another one in the anti-fundamental? The operator <laughs> that can live on the line in the planar limit are all factorized into fundamental and anti-fundamental. In other words, once you classify all the boundary operator that such line can end on, you automatically also classify in the planar limit all the operators that can live on the line. Of course, we can also dress them by color singlets, but these decouple in the planar limit. They don't, are not attached to the line. <clears throat> if you have just a straight Wilson line, it preserves a subset of the conformal symmetry, which is an SL2 for the line, times the U1 for rotation around the line. It turns out that all the boundary operators are uniquely classified by two quantum numbers. One is the conformal dimension, and the other is the transverse. For example, if we look on, on where, the, where this line operator can end on in the free bosonic theory, this operator takes the following form, they are just a scalar and a bunch of derivatives acting on it. So I took here a straight line in the third direction, and we classify the derivative by the longitudinal derivatives, and the derivatives in the transfer space that can carry charge plus or minus if I use like concoordinate to parameterize the field. So at three level, these are all the set of boundary operators. The one, the, the, the three level dimension is just one half the dimension of the scalar, that's the number, total number of derivatives. In S is the number of derivatives. It turns out that the operator with no longitudinal derivative, only transverse derivatives, 
have also SL2 binding. What we did next is to try to uh, study what are the uh, dimension in spin at the full quantum level. I'll first describe the result and then how we got it. So let me start with the transfer spin. <coughs> so it's turned out that the full quantum transfer spin get loop corrected, get anomalous spin, which is equal to plus lambda over two on the left and minus lambda over two on the right. So this is exactly what we expected naively for studying pure John Simon theory and looking on the dependence on the framing. The conformal dimension also get anomalous dimension, which here I'm focusing on the alpha equal to one operator, which is the same test, is just directly related to the spin. So this curly S is the exact quantum spin. This S is just the three level spin at the number of derivatives. You see that all the upper, all the boundary operators get anomalous dimension, which is equal to plus or minus lambda over two. <coughs> operators with the same anomalous dimension are related to each other by path derivatives. You have already some plus transfer spin. You can add more transfer spin by taking path derivative in the plus direction without changing the anomalous dimension. Although there is no such relation between operators with different anomalies. And the same thing also for a longitudinal derivative, they are just related by path derivative. Therefore, in order to uh, study all these operators, basically you have only four button operators, and all the rest of the operators are towers on top of this related by path derivative. For example, on the left, you have the operator with started life with zero spin. This is or left zero zero, and the one which has spin minus one at three level. You get opposite anomalous dimension, and all the rest are related to them by adding path derivative. They say the analog thing on the right with the flip of the transfer spin. So let me uh, now describe how do we derive this spectrum of boundary. The first thing we did is with the sum perturbation theory. If this light on gauge, we were able to resum all of perturbation theory and compute explicitly the anomalous dimension of this boundary. And in perturbation theory, you find that there is a simple kernel. There is a kernel that satisfies a simple recursion relation that you can resum explicitly. And the different operators just differ by the boundary condition of this recursion relation. So this is how we got the anomalous dimension, but Getting the anomalous spin is much, much harder. Remember, it's related to this framing regularization. If you start from a pure Chan Simon theory, you can check if you are doing perturbation theory that is indeed going to the right direction. But in order to fix it at finite coupling, it's, uh, you have to work much harder. And the way we did it is <laughs> first we tell us that it's enough to determine the anomalous spin for the four button operators of these four towers. Because once you know the anomalous spin for any one of them, path derivative just shifts the spin by one. This alpha equal to one operator turn out to have what we call a lift to a locally BPS Wilson line in the n equal to two Charles Ma Simon matter. The n equal to two Charles Simon matter theory is a theory that has both the fermion and the boson and some specific interactions between them. And the corresponding PPS line operator just to take the same form in the supersymmetric. Now, it turns out that uh, these boundary operators, these four exactly, are in BPS multiplets of the supersymmetry that is preserved by the straight line in the n equal to two. And the BPS conditions for uh, these operators allow us to relate their dimension to their spin. And I'll compute that, but we give you a relation between the dimension is in the transfer spin, which act like an out charge for this preserved uh, line surface. Now, it turns out that if you are in the plumber limit, you start with these line operators in the supersymmetric theories, but put bosons at the end point, actually, you know, they're the fermion decoupled. So the expectation value of these operators in the n equal to two theory is just the same as in the non supersymmetric. Therefore, by relating 
the dimensions to the spin in the n equal to two theory, you get the anomalous spin also in the non super symmetric. So you see, this is a proof for exactly this expectation that once you <laughs> tune the tooth coupling between zero and one, if you start with the endpoint with operator that was a boson, for example, the scalar, the moment that you get to lambda equal to one, it becomes Fermi, and the other way around. An explicit application. <clears throat> what is the operator of minimal dimension now that we can put on the line? Remember the operator on the line when it's factorized into fundamental anti-fundamental And the operator of minimal dimension is the one that started in life with, with the zero spin. And it's conformal dimension, it's just the sum of the two conformal dimensions, which is one to the last line. When it's bigger than one, this is an irrelevant deformation. We concluded the operator with alpha equal to one, it's a stable fixed point. Next, you want to uh, understand what is the dependence on the path of these line operators. For example, if I'm taking the simplest line operator along some smooth path between these two uh, button operators, we expect it to take the following form. Here are x left and x right are positions at the end point of the line. So the power is just two times the dimension of this operator. This captures the conformal dimension for the left. These ratios of the framing vectors at the endpoint of the line capture the anomalous spin, which is lambda over two. And here we expect some general conformal invariant function of the path. We'd like to understand what it is. And this is where the displacement operator n enters. So suppose we start with some smooth path and we do a small, smooth deformation of the path. At linear order, in the deformation, what we are inserting on the line is what is called the displacement operator. This is an operator which has spin one corresponding to the direction uh, that we uh, <coughs> deform and has dimension two, okay? corresponding to this x and b, which is the displacement. What we found is that the displacement operator for this operator is, is chiral. For example, for the one, if you do it in the minus direction, it Correspond to the product of this right operator which started life at spin zero, and the left operator which started his life at spin minus one. So the spin is carried here on the right with the left operator. But if we do the deformation in the opposite direction, the spin is carried on the right with the on the left with the right operator. Note that this is kind of unusual situation. The, dilata the displacement operator also is have dimension two. But here it comes about non trivially because the dimension on the left, both the operator on the left and on the right, each one of them get anomalous dimensions, they are exactly canceling each other. This is also later leads to some unusual bootstrap when you deform with dimension two operator, but you have anomalous dimensions. Let me see if I understand. So the, all was the operator that you inserted at the end point of the line. Oh, yeah. Or the bar. All of the vectors are inserted on the bar. It's now it's factorized into fundamental antifundamental. So they are product of two boundary spins. So this is operator in their joint, made of fundamental and antifundamental, factorized into this. So can you interpret all right and all left as moving the endpoint in some direction? I'm going to move in the endpoint in a second. This is moving the bar one. Right, but but. Do, do all right and all left have the interpretation of moving the endpoint to the line? No, this is this is moving the, this is doing a smooth deformation of all the line. I can write it as an integral, okay? All the displacement of it. But I thought, I thought you're saying that every every operator on the line yeah. at large n is the product of two operators on boundaries, right? Right. right. So it, if you're saying this bulk operator is kind of moving pinching up the line a little bit at the place where you inserted it. If you're also saying that that's the product of O right and O left, does that mean that O right and O left individually would move you know, yeah, half of the line up or down? Second order. Next order, you would have to move. That's all I'm just placing them on the plane. So this left and right operate on opposite anomalous dimensions that cancel each other, and opposite anomalous spin that exactly cancel each other such that the displacement operator is P1. 
Okay, the same spinning can be there. So here we see the picture that now when we uh, do this deformation, the displacement operator factorized. And if you are just, if you are now, for example, computing the expectation value, you just have the product of two expectation values. This is very nice loop type equations with this operator side. Not that it's a chiral. Um, related to your question, I know that there is also a boundary. So one way to uh, derive this equation is just to write, derive the Schwinger Dyson equation that follows from the definition of this operator. Alternatively, you can see that this, these are the unique operators on the line for this dimension two and spin one. So alternatively, you can just use them to deform the line, to define the line in general, starting from a straight line. In related to your question, the boundary operators also by themselves satisfy a sort of Schwinger Dyson equation. Next, um, so there is a single dimension equation that relates primaries only in the same tower with the same anomalous connection. Suppose I'm taking one of these operators in the tower, there's some large spin, and I want to reduce it by taking a path derivative in the minor direction. Then here, basically, there is the, uni the unique operator which has the corresponding spin reduced by two with the dimension increased by two, spin reduced by one. Sorry. And the coefficient here is a priori unknown, they're called beta bar. So this is the relation on the left, and there is an analogous uh, relation on the right with another term. Not in particular that there is no such relation between operators with different towers. I cannot flip the spin by taking path derivative. This is a different family of operators with different anomalous connections. Only operators in the same tower are related. And uh, the bootstrap give us automatically that both of these coefficients, which a priori could have been arbitrary function of the coupling, are equal to one half, which is the three level. So the three level list become like box by equal to zero. Analog of that. <coughs> from that, we know operator with alpha equal to one. Let me now go and quickly repeat everything for the operator with alpha equal to minus one. So we basically repeat the same steps uh, for the operator with alpha equal to minus one, just the anomalous spin is exactly the same. It's what you would naively expect, which is come from the Chell Simon interaction. It doesn't care so much about the vice color uh, relation. Also, here there are uh, four family, four thousand operators with these four operators at the bottom. But their spins in the anomalous dimension are flipped with respect to the alpha equal to one. So for example, here on the left, we have the what I call O tilde zero zero, which having one minus lambda over two instead of one plus over two, the post for alpha equal to minus one. And the other one in the tower has spin one instead of minus one, let's say. Also, this would be a unique uh, displacement operator is also factorized similarly. But now here the spin, the spin is carried uh, on the left, or before it was carried on the right, and that way for the other uh, direction. <laughs> to our surprise, so we repeated the same uh, strategy, also lifted them to uh, half BPS operators in the n equal to two theory. And surprisingly, the corresponding BPS operator in the n equal to two theory was not considered before, even though it related to the standard one, just by flip of one sign. As you see, it's very different. Uh, the operator with minimal dimension is again, this zero, zero times zero, zero. But now it has dimension one minus lambda instead of one plus lambda. It means that if you deform by it, this is a relevant deformation in the line. And if you uh, deform by it with a positive sign, you generate a flow to the alpha equal to one operator. So I'll argue uh, later when we talk about the fermionic theory, if I generate it with the opposite, we will flow to an almost trivial line. Okay. I'll describe this uh, later. So uh, we are done with the bosonic theory. Any questions? So let me, if no, let, let me now, uh, yes. And, and this uh, Schrenger-Dyson equation, you know, does that follow from 
clear the definition? We follow it and straightforwardly from writing the Schrodinger Dyson equation with the definition of this operator with the phi scalar adjoint in the exponent, or by noting that this is the unique operator with the right of the Okay, so the sum perturbation theory is uh, by itself. Uh, managed to compute all this. Question. Is it easy to see that the the uh, fermionic loops don't contribute? Again, is it easy to see that that the uh, that you said that just putting the the the, the bosonic operators on 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 the boundaries, uh, none of the bulk fermions contribute. Uh, of course, if you do a fermionic loop, because it's a fundamental, you will not contribute. But if you look in the details of the interactions between the fermions and the boson, they all will come up. Only because I'm going to do the one over somebody. So let me now describe the uh, picture in the uh, fermionic theory. So you consider just a standard Wilson line in the fermionic theory is turned out to be a good conformal operator. There is no beta function on the line. The next three level, the boundary operators, similar to uh, before, correspond to putting the two components of the uh, fermion, so here on the right, fundamental fermion, this is a three level carry spin plus one half and minus one half, and dressing them by covariant derivative longitudinal one or transverse. <clears throat> we repeated all the steps, including the lift to a locally VPS operator with the n equal to two theory. So you just summarize the result to find a perfect match with the alpha equal to one operator. For example, what started in life at three level is the scalar in the bosonic theory becomes the fermion with psi minus as you turn the coupling to the maximum value. And the other component of the fermion map to a plus derivative of that scalar. So the full spectrum and anomalous spin match between the two and also non trivially the form of the evolution. So this was the match with the alpha equal to one. But remember that for the bosonic theory, we had two operators. We differ by the sign of the bi-scalar exponent in the adjoint, in the exponent. So we should be able also to find the dual of the operator with alpha equal to minus one in the fermion theory. This turned out to be very confusing. Ain't come by, let's start with this operator in the bosonic theory with alpha equal to one. And try to see what happens when you take the coupling in the bosonic theory and take it to the maximal value where we expect to have a dual of a free fermionic. So suppose we consider that the simplest operator, the one that has the zero zero at the end point in the alpha equal to one theory and take the bosonic coupling to its maximal value. So it's going to take it the fermionic coupling to zero. Now that its dimension in that limit goes to zero, while its spin goes to plus or minus one, one half corresponding. We try to define such an operator in the fermionic theory. We should start with something that the three level is dimension zero and spin one half. In the free theory, this seems very confusing. Let me jump to the result, to the answer. So it turned out that in the fermionic theory, one has to condense the fermion in the fundamental in the exponent. If you look in perturbation theory, how this line looks like, it has pieces with fermion, fundamental and fundamental, and a Wilson line in between. In between them, it has almost empty regions, regions without fields. In these empty regions, what you have is what you call uh, the topological spin transport. This is <laughs> this connection, gamma. The gamma is a uh, spin connection that transforms the spin one half of this fermion to the other. And it's topological. Turn out that just to write such a, to such a topological connection to exist, you must introduce a framing vector. So here already at three level, it depends on the framing. 
remember this fermion on capital the Wilson line got an anomalous dimension. But when we condense it like that, all the logarithmics exactly cancel out, and we produce a spectrum and the, and the anomalous spin of the operator with r equal to minus one in the Wilson. So this weird uh, looking operator with condensed fermion in the fundamental in the exponent is just a fermionic description of a very standard operator in the bosonic theory, which is the Wilson line by a joint scalar index. So we repeated the, the lift of it also to an operator, supersymmetric operator in the n equal to two theory. This type of operator usually appear when you consider the quiver gauge theory, where what is uh, the empty part of the Wilson line here correspond to the other gauge group. We were taking the rank of one to two grade to, to be one, and therefore this piece of the line to be almost three. And again, this is the map between the operators in the bosonic and in the fermionic description. Just an empty endpoint in the fermionic theory mapped to the standard boson in the bosonic theory. And the derivative minus derivative, for example, of the fundamental bosonic field map into a minus derivative of the minus component of the field. I mean, if you go back to your previous slide for a second, just so I understand, is, is, that, uh, is, that, is that formula, uh, is this condensed thing? I mean, is it roughly the exponential of psi bar psi? Yeah, I can write it explicitly in that form. I have to introduce some two-dimensional space on the line and try to avoid. Uh, I mean, is there supposed to be a one over n factorial in this formula? Is this real? Is it? Depends if you are uh, summing over all ordering or fix the ordering. <laughs> so we find again a, a complete match, not just for the dimension, but also for the form of the evolution process. Deforming this fermionic line by the operator with minimal, by this uh, operator with minimal dimension, as described before, just give you the fermionic analog of the flow between the operator with alpha equal to minus one to the operator with alpha. You can think about it uh, intuitively as condensation as the of the pieces of the field piece of the line with a Wilson line. Remember the dual of the operator with alpha equal to one, just standard Wilson line. So they win in the IR and the but you can also start with this uh, operator condensed fermion in the fermionic theory and be formed by the same operator but with the opposite sign. And if you deform by the, with the opposite sign, intuitively now the empty lines win in the IR, not to remain with this almost trivial operator, this, this topological uh, parallel transport, but with the anomalous spin on one plus lambda and if you can start deforming back. <clears throat> From, uh, any questions? We're done describing the fermionic theory, then we will now go to the boost part. And uh, given time, I'll be uh, very short, even though this was the main part of this book. The main point of the boost part was to show that if you know the spectrum of boundary operators, and then it satisfies this evolution spectrum, and this completely fixes the representation value. What we did is form of a short of conformal perturbation theory starting with a straight line. If you consider first a straight line as expectation value, you just fix the conformal symmetry up to the number one constant to the one over the distance to the corresponding one. And then we systematically uh, perturb around it. And at any order in perturbation theory around the straight line, doing a smooth deformation of it, write just the most, all the relevant and marginal operators that you can insert on the line and at the boundary. Then we try to fix the coefficient systematically by imposing first conformal symmetry of the theory with the corresponding boundary dimension of spin. So, that doing so is not the trivial. You have to introduce the regulator, there are divergences, you have to introduce counter term. Turn out that just imposing conformal symmetry is not sufficient to fix all that. The non trivial step, what really allows us to fix everything, is to first deform it by arbitrary deformation. 
and then impose conformality on top of the arbitrary smooth deformation away from the curve. And this turned out to allow us again to fix all the coefficients systematically in the expansion around a straight line, and in particular to read here the two point function of the displacement operator. Now, not here the operator at the, at the end is any one of these four bottom operators. The two boundary bottom operators on the left, for example, are related to each other by dimension delta to two minus delta, delta two being the dimension of the displacement operator. This function indeed have this symmetry. So, for example, for the alpha equal to one operator, the relation between this delta and lambda is just one plus lambda over two or three minus lambda over if you consider the one with alpha equal to minus one, this one flip. The same, again, the same uh, function also control the two-point function of the displacement operator around the circular Wilson. The same function that also control the one over end correction to the expectation value of closed Wilson due to the cut into the mass. Let me summarize. Uh, future direction. So here we basically prove that in the planar limit, the expectation value of conformal line operators are the same in the bosonic tier and the Fermi limit. So they have the same spectrum, the same displacement operator, the same evolution equation. And these are sufficient to fix the expectation. In order to prove the duality in the planar limit, one also has to consider the connected correlation function between line operators or between line operators in local space. So for example, this connected operate, uh, <coughs> correlation function between two mesonic line operators. Here we expect that the spectrum of boundary operator evolution equation are not sufficient, but one has to add to them also the spectrum of single trace operator. This is exactly the point of the difference between the quasi boson and the quasi fermion theory enter. This is the dimension of the spin zero. Uh, after that, everything is. So, what we are working on is doing the nano boost up here and showing that this data is sufficient to fix the connected uh, correlation. Once you do that, then the duality basically follows. Because the dimension of the <coughs> local operators are known and match between the bosonic and fermion. Or with some uh, other uh, future direction. Here we show that the evolution equation and dimension of a uniquely fixed expectation value, but we haven't computed it explicitly. One would like to solve basically the equation that is satisfying, right? The dependence on the path for an arbitrary, arbitrary path of this operator. To solve for the expectation value explicitly. Very much related to that, we would like to uh, use them in order to derive the holographic dual of this theory. So this is, theories are famously dual to a parity breaking version of Vasiliev's theory. And this actually was our original motivation for this work. We expected this evolution equation would become a sort of universal constraint in the dualistic. I expect this two to be tightly related you had to introduce this construction in order to, to compute their expectation values. Let me finish with a bit uh, two more technical uh, comments. Uh, I didn't have time to describe the bootstrap really, but it turns out that the way it is solved is very non perturbative. I think that the two point function of this uh, O00, zero zero, it, uh, it had to mention one plus lambda over two. We have many time integrations of our powers that are one plus lambda. And when you do such integration, you produce one over the cut. So the way that this equation is uh, satisfied non perturbatively doesn't seem to commute with perturbation. So it's really interesting to show how it's still satisfied in very but same unrelated ways. And uh, lastly, when we did some perturbation theory, we did it in light convergence. And we did not only compute the dimension of the operator, which is local quantity, but we also computed the two point function of the displacement operator. And it turned out that light convergence doesn't give you the right answer. 
in fact, for many times because of this problem. The explicit all computation in the fermionic and in the bosonic we did not match. It turned out that glycon gate meet, meets this is a factor of sine pi lambda over pi lambda. And the same factor is also missed when you try to use glycon gate to compute the expectation value of a closed Wilson gate. So something goes wrong with, when you try to use glycon gate to compute non local observable. And I don't know why. For local quantities, there is no problem like the dimension of operator or correlation function seems so local observable. When you study non local observables, icon gauge does not give you the right answer. Thank you. And the icon gauge have all sorts of famous one over zero problems for. Uh, uh, Zero momentum exchanges, non local thing, vacuum structure, et cetera. You can do it in the computation explicitly, so that nothing goes wrong. You repeat the wrong answer. Not for the dimension, but for the overall. Who to compute the, the right computation? Who stops? Uh, very satisfying this so show that the boost not give us answer that was different from the light gauge and exactly was responsible to resolving the discrepancy between the bosonic and the so, sorry in particular in that formula for lambda delta you had this sign by can you go back to that formula yes. for are you saying that light cone gauge would have just given you a polynomial and uh, yes sorry, can you yeah yes yes the formula. Ah, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I see. So you're saying that 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 formula in light gauge would have just been a polynomial yeah. itself. Press this guy off and multiply it by lambda. This is the result that light light gauge would have. So also doesn't satisfy this relation that uh, must be there. Discrepancy. Yeah, we computed the uh, uh, this two point function and explicitly in some perturbation theory, separately in the bosonic theory, and separately in the thermionic theory, applying the map between the parameters, and it did not match. This is like on gauge. Yes. Any other questions for uh, Anna? Okay, if not, I remind you we're, we're taking him to a, a dinner. We'll get together in the lobby at six, and let's thank Ahmed again for a very beautiful talk. Thank you.